standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Hello, my friends. My name is Mike Casey with Pioneer Health and Missions, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. The title of today's presentation is, Do You Want to Be Healed? And we all want to be healed, don't we? Because we're all ailing, either physically or spiritually, or maybe both. Well, there is a cure, my friends, and that cure is found within the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And we're going to be looking at that prescription today, as well as the disease which causes much of our ailments. And forgive me in this presentation if you hear a few little birdies in the background because we are having a beautiful spring day and the birds are singing. And that's a glorious thing, isn't it? Hey, let's go to our opening scripture now. And it is found in Matthew 6, verse 33. And it reads, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen, my friends. For those who can, may we please kneel for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day, dear Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity to come before you in study and prayer and worship. Dear Lord, I ask that you will give us understanding and draw us closer to you, dear Lord. And please speak through me that the words I speak be the words that you would have me to say. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Faith. Faith is central to healing, and more specifically, faith in Jesus. And this is what we're going to be looking at today. This is the focus of our presentation, faith in Jesus, and what that faith means and what it could do for us, such as healing. And let's go to Scripture now. Let's look at Matthew 9, verse 29, and let's see the relationship between faith and healing. And Matthew 9, 29 says, Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. So we see here, according to their faith, they were healed, their faith in Jesus. And let's read another verse. This is Mark 5, 34, and it reads, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Again, faith is central to healing. In Mark ten fifty two, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Again, faith, faith in Jesus. And what did he do upon his healing? He followed Jesus in the way. Isn't that beautiful? There's healing for us, my friends. There is healing for us in our ailment if we would have that kind of faith. And what is that faith? We're going to look at it, and as we look at it, we're going to see there's a lot of other things involved with our faith. And first, we're going to look at another word. We're going to look at the word believing, believing and faith, and its role with faith. Now, on the surface, these two words, believing and faith, appear to mean the same thing. They are very similar, but they can also be very different in what they mean. And we're going to go to Scripture now and look at some of those differences, some of the textual differences between modern translations and the more traditional translations, such as the King James Version, which is what I normally use. But I want us to go to the New International Version today to see how the word faith is used to present something that might be a little bit confusing. Well, let's check to see, though. Let's go to Matthew 17, 20 now, and let's see how the word faith is used here and see what it says. It says, He replied, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. So on the surface now, we might not see anything wrong with the use of the word faith in this, in this verse. But let's look a little deeper. So what I've done is I've highlighted in blue the two times the word faith is used. And I'm going to read it again. It says, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and so on. So let's look at that first word faith now, the first time it is used. Jesus is saying, you only have a little faith, correct? That's what I take it as saying. You only have a little faith. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. So now Jesus is saying, if you had a little faith. So now I find this contradictory, a little confusing. Jesus is first saying, 
you only have a little faith. And then he's saying, if you had a little faith. So, which is it? It is kind of confusing, isn't it? Well, it is to me. So, let's go to the King James Version now, and let's see if it makes it a little bit more clear. And we see here, I have highlighted in blue again, the same areas that we're going to be looking at. And we see a new word has been brought in to replace the word faith. Now, let's read from the beginning. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, and so on. So what are we seeing here? Jesus is saying, you don't believe. But if you believe, if you had a little faith, but you don't, you don't believe. So this makes sense to me. I make a lot more sense out of this from the King James Version than I do from the more modern translations such as the NIV. So we see the word belief brought in, the word believe and faith. So they have a different structure here. But let's look a little bit deeper. And we're going to use an illustration for that. Looking at the words believe and faith. Now, if I were to ask how many of you believe that General Motors makes vehicles, I think most all of you would raise your hands because they make vehicles. I mean, that's pretty common knowledge. We, we, I would think we would all believe that. Now, if I asked how many of you have faith in those vehicles, we might not see every hand go up. We'd see some go up, but we'd see some that wouldn't. Because we have different belief systems. We don't all have the same faith in that product. So we see that we can believe in something and not necessarily have faith in that someone or something. Well, let's take this a little bit deeper. Let's look at these beliefs, this belief system thing because it does affect our faith. So let's say we don't believe in GM products, but now our neighbor does. So much so that he acts upon his faith and he goes out and buys a GM product. And he parks it in his driveway and he takes great care of it. He's always washing it and cleaning it and polishing it up so it looks all nice. He takes it to the dealership for routine maintenance. Well, we see that vehicle going up and down our road day after day. And after a while, we start to look at this vehicle and we say, you know... It's not a bad-looking vehicle after all. It starts to grow on us. Our paradigm starts to change. Our belief system is starting to shift now. And it continues to drive up and down our road. And we see it and we start to think, you know, it does keep holding up pretty well. It doesn't seem to break down. It seems to be running all right. Maybe those are okay vehicles after all. Our belief system changes even further, even to the point where we might act upon our faith as well and trade in that old vehicle in our driveway for a GM product. So we see here a belief system can change, but it could also change for the worse. Let's say now that same neighbor, he also did not have any faith in GM products. And that's all we heard from that neighbor. Oh, you don't want one of those. Stay away from those products. You don't want a GM. What's that going to do to our belief system? It's going to just entrench us all the more, isn't it? Is it going to make us want to step out and act upon our faith? Not likely. Maybe if we're influenced outside of our immediate surroundings. So we are seeing our immediate surroundings can influence us on what we believe. And our belief system can affect our faith. And whether we act upon our faith or not. So let's take this even further on the belief system and just see what it means. See what the actual meaning of belief system is. So let's look at the meaning now. And it says, something we are thoroughly convinced of, usually but not always, they are ideas, concepts that we gather through acquiring information and experience. So that's what we saw took place here in our little example. By the information acquired, a belief system can change for good or for the worse. Now, let's look at belief systems within the Bible. And for that, we are going to go to Matthew 14. And we are going to be reading about Peter walking on water. And I love this story. I, I, I hope you do as well. And it's a great way to illustrate what we're expressing here on belief systems. So let's go to Matthew 14. Now, we're going to be reading Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. And I read, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. 
And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. What a beautiful faith. Peter believed, and he had faith. He calls out to Jesus, If that be you, may I come unto you? And Jesus says, Yes, please, come unto me. And Peter steps out of that boat onto the water without no fear. He's focused on Christ. He has his hand out. Christ has his hand out. It's beautiful. What a beautiful belief system. But what about those in the boat? What kind of belief system did they have? Now, they didn't have the faith to step out, did they? They believed in Jesus, but they didn't believe that that was Jesus on the water. And they certainly didn't have no faith to step out, did they? A different belief system than Peter's. Let's continue reading. We're now going to verse 30, and it reads, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. So what's taking place here? A boisterous wind. And I'm sure the wind and the waves had an influence on Peter. But what about those in the boat? Could they have had an influence on Peter as well? Might they have been saying, Peter, what are you doing? Get back in the boat. You can't walk on water. Are you crazy? Get back in the boat. And Peter probably looked at himself and says, What am I doing? I can't walk on water. And he begins to sink. Does this happen in our lives today? How often do we see a new Christian filled with zeal and excitement? They're making changes in their life. They are changing their diet, their association, their entertainment, how they dress. They're no longer reflecting the world. They're starting to reflect Christ. Christ is working through them. And, but it doesn't take long. And that boat rose up, doesn't it? And that boat rose right up beside them. And they say, what are you doing? Get back in the boat. You can't work your way to heaven. Your works are filthy rags. Get back in the boat. You're born into a state of sin. You can't change. You can't overcome. You're just born that way. Get back in the boat. Are you crazy? And what happens? What happens to these new Christians? Well, most generally, they're either going to get in that boat or they're going to leave the faith altogether. Because what's the point? If it doesn't matter how I'm living and I'm just born into this state, I might as well go back to my old life and just believe, believe, believe. Like those in the boat that just believe. Fortunately, this wasn't the case with Peter. Peter wasn't like those in the boat that just believe, believe, believe. No, Peter had a faith that worked. He was willing to step out onto the water. He was willing to work with Christ. Was that Peter walking on the water? He wasn't working his way to heaven. No, he wasn't, my friends. He was allowing Christ to work through him. And that's what it means to have faith. That's what it means to allow Christ work through us. It's not working our way to heaven. It's allowing Christ and His righteousness in to allow His righteousness in. And we're going to continue reading now. We're in verse 31, and it says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth His hand and caught Him and said unto Him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? O thou of little faith. If Peter had only a little faith, what about those in the boat? What kind of faith did they have? What did their belief system yield? It didn't yield any faith, did it? They were not willing to act upon their faith. They believed in Jesus, but they did not believe that that was Jesus out on the water. Peter had a believing faith, a faith that works. Let's continue reading. We're on verse 32, and it says, And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Oh, this is beautiful now, isn't it? Because what's happening? Their belief system is changing. They say, Thou 
art the Son of God. They believed. If this same thing happened the next day, what do you think would happen? Oh, I think all those disciples would have stepped out onto the water. I think they would have all stepped out in faith. And Peter, what about Peter? He would have taken a few more steps, I think, don't you? He probably would have walked all the way to shore. He would have said, Jesus, come on, let's walk to shore. May I walk with you to shore? And Jesus says, I'm right here with you. And I could just see him walking all the way to shore. His faith grew. His faith would have grown. His belief system would have become stronger as the disciples. Their faith system now, their belief system now became stronger. They looked to Christ. They believed in Christ. What a beautiful thing. Thou art the Son of God. We're going to go to the Spirit of Prophecy now. We're going to learn about these two belief systems or two Gospels. And we're going to look specifically at the word believe, or rather, believe, believe, believe. And we're going to see how God speaks through the Spirit of Prophecy to show us these two different belief systems using these words. So let's see what Ellen White says here. And we're going to start with this first belief system. And it says, Come to the Lord just as you are. Cast your helpless soul and body upon the mercy and care of the tender shepherd. And believe, believe, believe. You will indeed see the salvation of God. Let your trust in God be unwavering. Present the promise and then rely upon the word that says, Ask and ye shall receive, but act your part faithfully and cling to the Mighty One. This is Peter's belief system, isn't it? He acted upon his faith. He believed. His trust was in his Savior. And he stepped out in faith. He believed he truly could do all things through Christ. Because, my friends, we can do all things through through Christ, which strengthen us. It's Christ working through us, my friends. It isn't our works. But we have to take those steps. We must take those steps. And that's a beautiful belief system, one that allows Christ to work within us. Let's look at the other belief system now. It says, Believe, believe, believe in Jesus is the soothing lullaby that is lulling the world to sleep in the cradle of carnal security. Why the devils believe and tremble? We need to be alarmed. We need to sound the cry, depart from all iniquity. Does this belief system want to depart? They don't, do they? They don't. They're comfortable where they are. They're inactive Christians. They want to stay in the boat. They don't want to get out. The other system is a doing system. Doers of the word. These are the don'ts. These are idle Christians. Now let's look at the word idle and see what that means. It means of a person avoiding work, lazy, without purpose or effect, pointless, pointless. If we believe that we can't overcome, that we can never attain perfection, that we are just born into a state of sin, what's the point? What's the point? We, are we just going to wait for, for God to zap us into good people? Is that what Scripture is about? Is that what the story is about? Is that what the Bible is about? Christ is preparing us for the kingdom if we are willing to allow Christ to work within us, my friends. But if we love this world too much, we are never going to get out of that boat. We will find every excuse to stay within that boat. Works. Works. Works is central to this. We have demonized works. But works is a good thing, my friends. Works is necessary. And it's a privilege. It's Christ working out His grace within us. No, we're not saved by our works. We are saved by that grace, that grace that is working out through us. That is what allows us to make those changes in our lives, my friends. But if we're not making those changes... That grace is not working through us. That righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, cannot work through us unless we are willing to work the works of Christ. It's not a bad word. It's okay to step out onto the water. It's okay to act upon our faith as long as we know it's Christ working through us and we continually seek Him. Let's read. It says, some may say it is exalting our own merits to expect favor from God through our good works. True, and I agree, so true. 
And it continues, says, we cannot buy one victory with our good works. Oh, that is true. Yet we cannot be victors without them. Who is saying this? This is the testimony of Jesus. That who, that's who's saying this, my friends. We can't ignore this. We can't accept all the saved by grace messages and ignore this other portion of it. Maybe they do go together. Maybe faith and works do to go together. And that's part of believing, if we truly believe. Let's look a little further here. What does James 2.17 say? It says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Why do we have this scripture? Why is this in the Bible? We can't remove this from the Bible and try to make sense of everything else. But it does make sense when we see how righteousness by faith truly works. If we desire that righteousness, that righteousness will come in. It is Christ working through us. It is not us. But we must have a willing heart. And we have to make those steps. We have to make those steps. A willing, working faith. Let's read about this. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And that's Romans 8, 9. We have no relationship with him unless we are willing to work the works of Christ. Are we willing or do we love our life too much? Are we willing to change? Because those are the works we're going to, going to be working. The works of change. Changing to Christ's righteousness. We have to want that righteousness. Are we willing to change our diet? Are we willing to change our dress? What we're watching on television? Because if we're not, if we're not willing to allow Christ in to work those works, we are none of His. The Holy Spirit sits on the sidelines. If we are not willing to let the Spirit of Christ in, we are none of His. We must be willing to work the works of faith. Let's look at two belief systems now dealing with this. We're going to go to 1 John 2, 16 and 17. And the first belief system, in verse 16 it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Are we hanging on to this? Are we staying in the boat, listening to the chatter, so we can hang on to the world? My friends, the Father isn't in us, if that is the truth. We are not of the Father. His Spirit is not in us, and with us. Or even, it's on the sidelines, my friends. Let's look at the other belief system. This is verse 17. It says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now which is it? Are we abiding? Are we doers? Are we willing to do the word of God? The will of God? And abideth forever? We're not doing it alone. Was Peter doing it alone? No. He didn't step out on his own. He stepped out though. But Christ was working through him. And he allowed that because he wanted to be with Christ. He stepped away from the boat, from those within the boat. These are the doers. Verse 16, the, the text before this, those are the don'ts. Those are the ones within the boat. Two belief systems. What belief system do you belong to? What belief system do you want to belong to? This is why we're in alarming condition, my friends. We're not allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us. We are keeping the Holy Spirit at bay. And let's read about this. And what has caused this alarming condition? Many have accepted a theory of the truth who have had no true conversion. They have not truly let Christ in. There's no true conversion. There's no commitments. So there's no willingness to even begin to step out of that boat and act upon their faith. Let's continue reading. It says, I know whereof I speak. Few are willing to fall upon the rock and be broken. We need to be broken. We need a deep, earnest repentance. Taking to the Lord in prayer and say, Hey, Lord, please hear me. I'm sorry. Please help me turn from my ways. I don't want these ways anymore. I want your righteousness. And that's when healing begins, my friends. When we are willing to turn 
and do whatever Christ asks of us, whatever His will may be. Are we willing? Are we willing to do that? Because He's willing to take us home. If we're willing to change, He is willing to take us home. Righteous by faith. And that's what it comes down to, my friends. Righteousness by faith. Do we want righteousness? Are we willing to take it in faith and act upon that righteousness in faith? Before we read about righteousness by faith, let's look at two words, imputed and imparted. It's important that we understand these two words if we're going to understand righteousness by faith. And we read, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. We see two roles here. Justification, this is imputed righteousness. This is when we fall on that rock in in repentance and Christ steps in. His righteousness, it covers us. It, It steps in for us. His merits... And we are justified when we sincerely, sincerely repent. But we also commit, we commit in faith to go and sin no more. We step out in faith. We are justified in faith. And that faith is also that walk forward. And then we have righteousness by faith. That is the sanctification process. That is that walk forward. That is allowing Christ to work through us. His righteousness is imparted to us. It works through us because we want the same thing. We are willing to change our life, to leave the world behind, to be sanctified, to make those changes, to work the works of Christ. Christ working through us. That is sanctification. We cannot take sanctification out of the process. We can't take works out of the process and just claim justification. It doesn't work that way. Because if we're not willing to live a sanctified life, that justification does not stick. If we can't go back to our old ways and expect to still be justified, no, we can't get back in the boat or stay in the boat and expect to be justified. That's not how faith works. Faith is willing to walk forward. We could be forgiven, we could be healed, but we also must be willing to walk forward in righteousness and desire that desire the life that Christ would have for us. Let's continue reading. It says, Through His grace they are justified, made righteous, and every soul to whom Christ has imparted His righteousness is under solemn obligation to practice that righteousness. The imputed righteousness of Christ will become implanted righteousness if if they will continually follow in His steps. There's a condition to justification. There's a condition if we are willing to walk in the ways of Christ. Not our old ways. We can't be throwing out excuses. Oh, I'm just born this way. No, that doesn't work, my friends. We must be willing to change, to allow Christ to work within us and change us. A new walk forward. Do as Christ commanded after his work of healing. Go and sin no more. That's John 8, 11. Are we willing to go and sin no more? Because that is righteous by faith. Willing to go and sin no more. In faith, we allow Christ and His righteousness in. And we believe that that's Christ's righteousness working through us. And we're stepping out of that boat. We believe that when we step out, that we are going to be performing the works of Christ. And that is our goal. And we strive for that daily. And we're going to fall a lot. We're going to want to sink a lot. And we reach up and Christ is going to grab us. Lord, save me. Get back on the water. Christ says, step back up. Continue on the path. Keep seeking me. My righteousness is with you. We'll get home. We'll get home. Don't get back in that boat. Stay with me on the water. Stay with me on the water. Righteousness by faith. Let's read about righteousness by faith. Now we are going to go to the Old Testament. Not the new. I want us to see that the righteous by faith message is throughout the Old Testament as well. It's not something specific to the new. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 6.25, and it reads, And it shall be our righteousness if, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded. That's righteous by faith. Are we willing to do the commandments of God in the sight of God, allowing his righteousness in? 
Because if we are willing, then Christ is there with us because He's willing also. If we are willing. Righteous by faith requires a willing heart. We're going to go to the spirit of prophecy now to read about righteous by faith. And yes, we're going to the spirit of prophecy and not Wagner and Jones, which is normally the go-to. And I love the early years of Wagner and Jones. And we need that 188 message today. It's about bringing more of Christ in. And as you're seeing, we can't do any of this without Christ. But what is the spirit of prophecy? It's a testimony of Jesus, isn't it? And he has not forget to let us know, forgotten to let us know about his righteousness and how much he loves us, his matchless charms. And let's see now what Ellen White says about her writings and righteousness by faith. So let's read. And it says, I have had the question asked, what do you think of this light which these men, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, are presenting? This, speaking of the 1888 message, Righteous by Faith. And she says, Why, I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years. The matchless charms of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds. Oh, the matchless charms of Christ. They're throughout the spirit of prophecy. It's beautiful. It's throughout the Bible. It's beautiful. Let's start reading now. Uh, this is from the Spirit of Prophecy on Righteousness by Faith. In order to meet the requirement of the law, our faith must grasp the righteousness of Christ, accepting it as our righteousness through union with Christ, through acceptance of His righteousness by faith. We may be qualified to work the works of God to be collaborators with Christ. Oh, what does that mean to accept His righteousness by faith is to desire it, is to want it, is to have the same desires as Christ. Our will matches His will. We want that life. And we have faith that through Christ we can attain it. That all things are possible through Christ. And we accept it. Through Christ we walk forward. And we believe that when we step out of that boat that Christ is with us. We believe that His righteousness is with us. We are collaborators with Him, willing collaborators with Him. Let's go to the dictionary and let's look at that word collaborators before we go back and finish this, this, uh, this reading from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, one who labors with another, an associate in labor. So it's a partner. We are partners. We are, we are partners with Christ. We work together. It's cooperation. That's what righteousness by faith is. It's not one-sided. No, we can't do anything without Christ. But Christ can't do anything without us. We've got to get out of the boat. We've got to get out of the boat. And we, we're back to the spirit of prophecy now. We continue reading. If you are willing to drift along with the current of evil and do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies in restraining transgression in order that everlasting righteousness may be brought in, you do not have faith. If we do not cooperate in restraining transgression, everlasting righteousness can't come in. We don't have faith if we are not doing our part. Christ isn't working through us. We're not stepping out of the boat. We have to step out of the boat and work with Christ. We could claim righteousness by faith all day long, but if we're not willing to step out of that boat, then it can't work within us. It just can't, my friends. It just can't. That's why what we're reading in the Spirit of Prophecy is here on works. That's why what the Bible says about works is there. It's about us doing our part and allowing Christ to work through us. But it's through Christ. Yes, on our own, our works are, are, are meaningless. They are filthy rags. But it's not when we're focused on Christ. It's Christ working through us. We can't confuse the two. It's not like the Pharisees. They didn't believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you need to be stepping out in faith and doing the works of Christ, allowing Him to work through you. I hope you can see this, my friends. I hope you can see what I'm trying to convey here. We need to go home. We need to be healed. We need to want it. We need to want Christ's righteousness. Let's continue reading. It says, Faith works by love and purifies the soul. Through faith, the Holy Spirit works in the heart to create holiness therein. But this cannot be done unless the human agent will work with Christ. This is the spirit of prophecy speaking on righteousness by faith. 
It's not a one-sided pendulum all the way over to believe, believe, believe. That's not righteousness by faith. Those are the people in the boat. When we are willing to cooperate, when we are willing to work with Christ, that is when we start moving forward, my friends. That's when we start walking on water. We can move mountains. We can walk on water if we but have a little faith, a little faith that works. We're going to read now from the Spirit of Prophecy again. And we're going to be reading about both oars in the water. And we read, it says, Faith and works are the two oars with which we are to make our way in the Christian life. The Lord calls upon all who think they know what faith is to be sure that they are not pulling with only one oar and their little bark going round and round, making no progress at all. My friend, this is the story of those who are in the boat. It's just believe, believe, believe. It's going in circles. Believe, believe, believe. Rowing in a circle. Believe, believe, believe. Just going in circles. That's not what we want, my friends. That's not what we want. We need to get that other oar in our water. We need to have a, not only a believing faith, but a faith that works, my friends. A believing faith and a faith that works. And we start moving forward. We get that other oar in. We start acting on our faith. Believing faith. Acting on our faith. And what's driving this boat forward? It's Christ. It's Christ and His righteousness working through us. And we're moving forward in the straight direction towards Christ. Christ is bringing us home. We're moving forward, both oars in the water. Let's continue reading. Faith without intelligent works is dead. Now we're going to pause there again. Faith without intelligent works. That means we have to put some thought into it, doesn't it? And what are those works? Well, what about our diet? If Christ is saying, hey, I would rather you didn't eat that because it's affecting you. It's, it's in the way between my righteousness and you. I want my righteousness to work through you. Can you please stop eating that for me? Would you do it if Christ asked you that? He's given you some light. What do you think he's been doing? What do you think the spirit of prophecy has been saying? Are you willing Are you willing to put that aside? Say to the Lord, I am sorry. Fall on that rock. Oh, I have a problem with food. Please take this from me. I want your righteousness. Oh, Christ will step in, I promise you. You put that other oar in the water. Christ will step in, my friends. What about television? What are we watching? Are we watching people sin and finding enjoyment in that? Do you think Christ is sitting next to us while we watch people sin on television? And that's most of what it is. Or on the computer. My friends, we might have to put some thought into that too. Walk over to television and turn it to something that Christ would sit next to us and watch or turn it off and go open our Bibles. You know Christ will be with you there. Are you willing? Are you willing to make those changes? Make an intelligent effort to make changes in your life? For Christ. For yourself. For healing. For Christ. Let's continue reading. Faith in the healing power of God will not save unless it is combined with good works. There is no healing power unless it is combined with good works. We can't ignore this. This is the testimony of Jesus. This is the spirit of prophecy. This message is for us. This is a last day message. This is present truth, my friends. This is present truth. We cannot be saved without an earnest effort. But remember, that earnest effort is not us, my friends. That is Christ working through us. Are we willing? Are we willing to make those changes in intelligent works? Making an intelligent effort to change our lifestyle. But remember, that's the Holy Spirit nudging you to do so. And that's Christ, the Holy Spirit, working through you should you decide to do so. But my friends, this is why we are sickly and ready to die. We are sickly and ready to die because we are not willing to let the Holy Spirit in. 
We are not willing to let Christ in. We're not willing to live a righteous life. Let's read about this. The reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the Comforter, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Yes, the Holy Spirit admonishes. It reproves us. It's showing us our sins so we could fall on the rock and repent. And shows us the way. Walk in this way. Walk away from the bad diet. Walk away from that television if you're not going to watch something you should. Walk in this way. How often do we hear people say, oh, don't look to self. You're just looking to sin. You can't look to self. No, we can't look to ourselves to overcome, my friends. Because as we have seen here, it's only through Christ that we could do this walk. But the Holy Spirit saying, hey, look at yourself. Look at yourself. You're wretched. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. Please turn away. Allow me to work within you. And we could block the Holy Spirit. We could block the Comforter. We often look at the corporate church where we see these sayings about those that are rejecting the Comforter as, as being that of Christ. And it's true. And when I say cor- corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, I say that as opposed to the Seventh-day Adventist non-Trinitarian movement. Because the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, they do worship the Trinity. And yes, they are rejecting Christ as the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that the Holy Spirit is, the, is Jesus Christ. But what about us? We have accepted the one true God and His only begotten Son. We believe that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and Son, the Comforter. Are we still pushing the Comforter away? Are we still pushing the Holy Spirit away because we want to stay in the boat? We love the boat too much to step out of it? Is that what we're doing? Or will we allow the Holy Spirit to reprove us, to admonish us, to cause us to leave this boat, to leave it and step out in faith? Because Christ is there for us. If we are willing to take His righteousness into our lives, into our hearts, works is not a bad word, my friends. It's a beautiful word when you realize that that is Christ working through us. If we want the same thing, And if we are willing. Well, there's a prescription for all this, my friends. And I think you know what that is. It's Christ and His righteousness. This is the prescription if we are willing to take it. Let's look at the first step now. And we read, The time has come when our people will be called to come over on the side of the Lord. We have no more time to be uncertain. If the Lord be God, serve Him. If Baal, then serve him. Yes, it begins with the God we serve. My friends, if you are worshiping the Trinity, the false gods of Babylon, my friends, please step out. Please step out and accept the God of the Bible, the Almighty Father and His only begotten Son. And allow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Father and Son to dwell within you, to help you to overcome, letting Christ's righteousness in. That's where it starts with the God we serve. If we don't believe Jesus to be the only begotten of the Father, there is no strength, there is no power. There's no power to overcome in the Trinity. There's no power there. It's not the God of the Bible. None of this means anything if we are worshiping the false gods of the Trinity. So it begins with the God we serve. That is number one. And then, my friends, we need to believe, believe, believe. Yes, and we know how we are to believe. Not the believe, believe, believe of those in the boat. The believe, believe, believe of Peter, willing to step out of the boat, step out in faith, and put away our faulty belief systems, my friends. It's holding us back. My friends, we can't be listening to those that are calling us into the boat. We can't be listening to those people anymore. We need to be stepping out of that boat. Let's read now about faulty belief systems. It says, At the time of their conversion and baptism, the Colossian believers pledged themselves to put away beliefs and practices, faulty belief systems, that had hitherto been a part of their lives and to be true to their allegiance to Christ. In his letter, Paul reminded them of this and entreated them not to forget that in order to keep their pledge, they must put forth constant effort against the evils that would seek for mastery over their lives. 
My friends, that's something else in the Bible we tend to forget. Paul does talk about works. He talks about the importance of Christ. Oh, yes. And, oh, yes, we can't have those works without that. But Paul doesn't... Paul fought the good fight. He doesn't disregard works. Let's continue reading. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, he said, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Is your life hid with Christ in God? Is it? Are you making the changes necessary? Are there any gray areas? My friends, if there is, we need to repent. We need to fall on the rock of Christ and allow Him to change us. Allow Him to work through us, transform us into His image. And let's look at that. Those who have professed to love Christ have not comprehended the relationship which exists between them and God. They do not realize what a great privilege and necessity are prayer, repentance, and the doing of the words of Christ. Prayer and repentance, a privilege and a necessity. Oh, we're blessed, my friends. We have a Savior to go to. We have a rock to fall on. Let the Holy Spirit work within. Show us these faults that we could repent and begin a new walk. Because what does it say here after repentance? And the doing of the words of Christ. That's that new walk forward. We could be justified. We could be healed if we are willing to go through the sanctification process. And walk in Christ. Allow His righteousness to work through. Allow Him to transform us into His image. That's what it's about. That's what that faith is about. You want that righteousness so bad that you allow Christ's righteousness in to transform us into His image. It's what you want. You don't want that TV. You don't want the food you shouldn't be eating. You want to please God. You want His righteousness. You want to live now as we will be in heaven. That's total commitment. That's total commitment, my friends. And let's read about that. And will God be pleased with anything less than the best we can offer? Said Christ, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Those who do love God with all the heart will desire to give Him the best service of their life, and they will be constantly seeking to bring every power of their being into harmony with the laws that will promote their ability to do His will. Are you doing things in your life that will promote your ability to do the will of God, to make it easier for Him to work through you? Again, diet. What we're choosing for entertainment? Are we? Because He wants to take us home if we are willing. He wants to heal us. Christ wants to make us well. He wants to save us from our sins if we are willing to let Him. Are we willing to live a righteous life. And that's what it comes down to. Are we willing to step out in faith and act upon our faith? To strive to live a righteous life through Christ? Are we willing to put in that effort? Let's read about that. Submit your will to the will of God and you will grow in grace and will gain a rich experience. You will have a faith that works by love and purifies the soul. The fruits of the Spirit will be seen in your life. The efficiency of the Spirit will be revealed in your works. And those aren't your works, are they, my friends? Those are Christ's works working through you, if you will let Him. Let's continue reading. It says, Christ is a sympathetic, compassionate Redeemer. Now, just now, place yourself on His side. He will receive you. The blessings of God is worth everything to you. I urge you to step out in faith and receive it. Oh, my friends, if you are willing to step out in faith and receive it, to step out of that boat, thou mayest be healed. Thou mayest be healed. And we read, He is bending over the purchase of His blood, asking with inexpressible tenderness, pity, and love, Wilt thou be made whole? 
He invites, Come unto me, and be ye saved. I have borne thy iniquities. By my stripes laid on me, thou mayest be healed. He is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask than parents are to give good gifts to their children. But we must yield ourselves wholly to Him. Oh, Christ wants to heal you. If we are willing to yield ourselves wholly to Him, He wants to heal you physically or spiritually. Healing might come instantly. It might come over time. And it might not be till Christ comes. But if we are saved, if we are saved, if we are saved from our sins, my friends, we are healed. And we will see our Savior. And we will see a better place. And we might see healing now. If we are willing to change our diet and live by the laws that God has given, we could be healed now. We could be healed now. If we are willing to make those changes. My friends, sin started with diet. Maybe we need to start changing our diet so we can reverse that process. That might be the first step in our healing. That might be the first step. For others, it might be something else. But for many, that might be the first step. If we truly want healing, we must do our part. And Christ is waiting for that repentant heart. Let's look to the story of Paul. At one time, while Paul was telling the people of Christ's work as a healer of the sick and afflicted, he saw among his hearers a cripple whose eyes were fastened on him and who received and believed his words. Paul's heart went out in sympathy toward the afflicted man, in whom he discerned one who had faith to be healed. In the presence of the adulterous assembly, Paul commanded the cripple to stand upright on his feet. Hitherfore, the sufferer had been able to take a sitting posture only, but now he instantly obeyed Paul's command and for the first time in his life stood on his feet. Strength came with this effort of faith. And he who had been a cripple leaped and walked. My friends, do you want to leap and walk? Are you willing to make an effort of faith? Are you willing to step out of that boat? My friends, we can walk on water. We can walk on water if we are willing. We can move mountains if we are willing to let Christ's righteousness in. We can walk on water. Are we willing to step out in faith? Are we willing to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Let's read from Jesus now. It says, Do you want to be healed from your sins? Heed the invitation of Christ. Come to Him of your own free will and put yourself under the care of this mighty healer. Then Christ can say to you, as he did to the poor paralytic, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. We must understand this soul healing. Then we shall not inquire, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? There is one who is longing to be your healer. One who has all power. But you must place yourself under his care to do His will, and take His prescription. Are you willing to take His prescription? Oh, Jesus loves you, my friends. He loves you so much. He wants to give you His righteousness. If you are willing to reach out and take it, He wants to heal you. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed, my friends? Oh, let our Savior in. Let our Savior into your life. Say goodbye to this world. Turn your back to it. Trade in this old life for a new one. A new one focused on Christ, centered on Christ. That's faith, my friends. That's the faith that heals. A faith that relies on the righteousness of Christ. We're going to close with Scripture. We're going to close with Matthew 11, verses 28. And And it reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. My friends, these are the words of Christ. Do you want rest? Oh, he's offering it for you. He wants you. He loves you. He wants to give you his righteousness. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? My friends, if you do want to be healed and you're willing to accept Christ as your Savior and you're willing to fall upon that rock and repent and ask the Lord to help you in a new walk forward, striving for the righteousness of Christ in faith, willing to step out of that boat, you will be healed, my friends. Our Savior loves you. He's calling to you right now. And my friends, wherever you are, wherever you are right now, if you will please join me, if you will please join me in a word of prayer. And for those who can, may we please kneel. Our Father in heaven, oh, you are such a mighty God. You are such a righteous God. We are so fortunate to have your love. We are so thankful to have a blessed Savior. We thank you so much for your only begotten Son, Jesus, and the righteousness that is being offered. Dear Lord, I pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you will give us the willing heart, the faith, and the courage to step out and take your hand. Dear Lord, please take us home. Please heal us of what ails us, and please take us home. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth.